Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. I'm John Cavadini. I'm the director of the Institute for Church Life. And our series, Saturdays with the Saints, is held each Saturday morning of a home football game. Friends, Saturday is the ancient Sabbath. And both in Jewish and Christian antiquity, the Sabbath was taken as an image for eternal life because it was the day on which God rested. And so therefore it becomes an image of eternal rest, of the eternal life with the saints. So in, in, in some ways, friends, are what we're going to be doing for eternity is spending Saturday the Sabbath with the saints. So our lecture series is a little contemplative foretaste of eternal life, and not very many lecture series can claim that. <laughs> I would like to, before, rec uh, before I introduce my speaker this morning, I'd like to recognize the presence of Cardinal Roger Mahoney, who is with us this morning. Also of trustee Mr. Nacho Lozano with us this morning. Also trustee Mike Geddes and his wife Sheila and the, the, um, the name of this building, Geddes Hall, and Mike's last name is no accident. <laughs> we welcome you. Friends, the saints are the true bearers of light within history, for they are men and women of faith, hope, and love. Benedict XVI and God is love. And our lecture series this semester focuses on persons of light in particular times of darkness. We are focusing on 20th century martyrs of, of the Christian faith. Father Virgil Elizondo, our speaker for this morning, is a priest of the Archdiocese of San Antonio. He holds an endowed chair for pastoral and Hispanic theology right here in the Department of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. He's also a fellow both at the Institute for Latino Studies and the Kellogg Institute. Apart from the president of our university, Father Elizondo must be the most recognized person on campus. He's a Leitari medalist from 1997, and this is the highest honor that our university bestows. And he's also recognized by Time Magazine as one of a handful of honorees as spiritual innovators for the new millennium. Father Virgil has also received both the John Courtney Murray Award from the CTSA, Catholic Theological Society of America, and the Johannes Claussen Award from the Catholic University of America. And those are both for excellence in theological studies. Father Virgil is widely recognized as the founder of U.S. Latino theology. Many of his books are in and past their 10th printing, as they are widely used on college campuses, both secular and religious. Guadalupe, Mother of the New Creation, The God of Incredible Surprises, Jesus of Galilee, The Way of the Cross, The Passion of Christ in the Americas, and others, these are representative examples. Astonishingly, this chaired professor and most recognized person and beloved teacher on campus still works in San Antonio half of each week as a parish priest, where for many years he also served as the visionary rector of the Cathedral of San Fernando. Under his leadership, the cathedral became not only the spiritual center of the archdiocese, but also a spiritual center and source of hope for the whole city where anyone, no matter what their faith or lack of faith, knew they would find assistance in time of financial or spiritual trouble, a ready ear, and a counsel of loving wisdom. I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming Father Elizondo, who will speak to us today on the topic, Father Stanley Rother, Servus Dei. A shepherd cannot abandon his people. Please join me in welcoming Father Elizondo. John for the marvelous introduction. I hope it talks about be like eternity. You know. um, I'm very glad to be here to speak about a classmate of mine. We're actually, Stanley and I were actually born the same year. He was four months older uh, and we were ordained on the same date. 
uh, except we were ordained in different places. He was ordained in Oklahoma City, and I was ordained in San Antonio, Texas. But I got to know Stanley in the seminary, and I remember him very well because he, he was a farm boy. He came from a German community in Oklahoma. They were had the German farmers in Minnesota, and then they, part of the family had moved to Texas. And his father used to say that Stanley was born in the midst of the famous dust storm that went through. And it, at the same moment that a calf was being born with a broken leg, so the father had to attend to the birth of both the calf and the baby. Yeah. You know? and, but Stanley was a, a farm boy, he, and he loved farming. In fact, when he decided to go to the seminary, his father wondered why he hadn't taken Latin in school except they, they belonged to the farm club. But, but Stanley always loved the earth, and in seminary, uh, it, it, he was not good at studies. Um, <laughs> in, in, fact, in fact, he couldn't learn Latin, he couldn't learn Greek, he couldn't learn philosophy, he couldn't learn theology. He just wasn't interested. Um, <laughs> the subjects of, of the Trinity and of God and all these things were too much. He, we had a greenhouse in the seminary, and he would spend most of his time in the greenhouse cultivating plants that are actually trees around the Sumter Seminary now. But eventually, unfortunately for the seminary, he was dropped because they felt he just couldn't make it. He just didn't have what it took to, to become a priest. But his bishop believed in him. His bishop believed in him, so he they had tutors for him for a couple of years and then sent him to Baltimore to finish studies and ordained him a priest. So he was a year ahead of me in seminary, but we took a lot of classes together in those days. He was double up. Uh, I remember Stanley very well as a very quiet fellow. He was a very quiet fellow. He didn't talk too much. You had to approach him to get him to say something. And normally the conversation was answered simply, yes, no, and that was it, you know. He wasn't too much into conversation, but he was a quiet fellow. Uh, he was a quiet fellow, very charming, very enjoyable. And he, once he was ordained, he was asked to serve in the Oklahoma mission in Guatemala. You might remember that Pope John XXIII had asked for the bishops to send priests to Latin America and to China and to Africa. And it was part of, the, part of that mandate of the Pope that Oklahoma set up a mission in Santiago Atitlan, which is, you'll see it in a moment, it's a very beautiful region, but at the same time it's a region that's incredible poverty. I mean, the contrasts are unbelievable. Tourists go and they love it. The people there suffer like anything. You know, so as Oklahoma had already established a mission on there when Stanley was asked if he would go, and he decided, yes, he would go. Uh, he actually drove down there from Oklahoma through Texas and Mexico and drove an old beat-up car and took along a trailer uh, with equipment to remove trees so he could turn uh, the, some of the area into farmland. Uh, that, that was his gift, farming. Uh, and what, what he didn't have in the seminary that booted him out what would become his greatest gift in Guatemala. Uh, he went there, he was a simple priest, he wasn't a revolutionary in any sense of the word, and yet he, he, in a way he lived the greater revolution of the gospel. He was a real evangelical person. He really, he really fell in love with the people, fell in love with the people, he learned the languages very well, no problem learning the languages there. There was a reason for it. Uh, he, could, he could learn the Tetzal and the Spanish, and he became multilingual. In, in, the, in fact, he was into translating the Bible into the local language of the people. So that was Father Stanley. He was a very beautiful person, very simple priest. Yeah, you wouldn't expect anything great out of him, and yet the greatest came out of him. And I think that's the beauty of the gospel, that it was simply his prayer. His, he, he was, his letters home were always about the sacraments, about the nuns he had got. He got some native nuns to come in, and they would animate the Mass and animate the the, the marriage counseling and First Communion and Confirmation, there was always first concern. And as, as things got worse in Guatemala, he would write letters and say, you know, maybe I can't do much for these people, but at least I can give them hope and accompaniment. Uh, I, can accompany, I can accompany them. And that's where he's famous, one of his famous sayings, he had several, uh, a shepherd cannot abandon his people. He wrote that several times. In the midst of the suffering, he said, you know, I cannot leave. Uh, I cannot leave now simply because there's danger here. The people need their shepherd more than ever before. And he stayed there. That he, was on the death, he was on the death row, on the death list, on the hit list. He was on the hit list, and he knew he was on the hit list. But, but he still continued to go. He came home one time, and many of us tried to talk him not, not to going back uh, because he had already had threats of death. 
But, but he said, I remember, I'll never forget this statement. He said, you know, he says, I'm really scared. I'm really scared to go back. By the way, by this time, he was the only priest left. The others had already left, and, and he was the only American left on the scene. But he decided to stay, and he said, you know, I'm really scared to go back. Said, but my love for my people is greater than my fear of death. So I'll go back, and sure enough, I mean, he got killed after he, after he died. Uh, the people requested that his, uh, the, the Oklahoma dies wanted to bring his body back, and the, die, and the people there wanted to keep it. So they finally came to a compromise that they would bury his heart in Atitlan, and they would bring the body back to Oklahoma. Uh, and so his heart is still there, and the body's back in Oklahoma. But we told you show you a short video. It's, it's a few minutes uh, of a much longer video about Stanley, that you, to get a, a visual sense of the area he worked in. It, it was the most impoverished area in Guatemala, and yet probably the most beautiful. It's an incredible contrast. It was by uh, three years after Jim. So we were pretty close in age. That's his, um, sister. That's his sister's We brother. were kind of recognized by that when we went to school, like the three of us older ones. I remember one of the teachers referring to us as the three bears, because we were always together. We always came in school together. and. That's the way they saw us. That made his background. Stan grew up on the farm learning how to work the land. He had a feel for things mechanical. And when it got time for me to run the equipment, then he was gone off to school and, and then, it, then I took over. But before that, he, when he ran the combines and such, I, would, I run a tractor and did things in the field like that. Did he like farming? Oh, yes. He always loved farming. We put up a lot of hay off of this field right here. Alfalfa. Hauled it in the, hauled it in the hard way. The, just drop it on the ground and pick one bale up and put it on the truck and load the truck and then take it to the barn, take it right up there to that barn and, and put it in the barn. And then all winter long, you pull it back out and feed the cattle. And then, and then you got to clean the barn out to to get it out for the last time. <laughs> when uh, Stan mentioned something to me about going to the seminary, I says, why, Stan? I says, uh, That's his father. why did you take FFA instead of Latin? I said, now you're going to have, have to take <laughs> Latin courses. <laughs> <And> <laughs> but it all worked out. It all it just all seemed to fit in. There was, there was a reason for it. He was, uh, he was different than the other children. I could tell that. And uh, he just, uh, he didn't talk very much, you know, like, like the others, but uh, he just, uh, it just seemed like he had something in, him, in his mind. He wasn't going to, you know, talk about it. After graduating from high school, both Stan and his sister left home. Stan to enter a seminary, his sister to join a religious community. So it was on August 20th of 53 that the folks and well, the family took me to Wichita. Um, and then two weeks later, they took Stan to San Antonio. So I always felt kind of bad knowing that uh, their family went from four to two in just a matter of a couple of weeks. And I think it was harder on the folks than we ever realized. Seminary years were academically rough for Stan. He struggled through college at Assumption Seminary in San Antonio. But after failing the first year of theology twice, he was asked to leave. Stan still wanted to be a priest, so Bishop Victor Reed arranged for special tutoring in Oklahoma City, and then had him transfer to Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. I first knew Stan in the seminary in San Antonio. He was a farm boy from Okarchi, very quiet, so uh, he wasn't obtrusive or anything of that sort. Very quiet young man who studied, was very sincere, uh, very diligent in his work, but he did those things that he was able to excel in. And the things that he was able to excel in were like uh, farm work, fixing things, fix-it man, and electrician, and all kinds of things of that sort. Really got to know him as we traveled back and forth from Oklahoma to the seminary during uh, Easter and Christmas breaks. And in those times, again, he was very quiet, but he would be the one who would do all the work. He drove all the way both directions, you see. So uh, a quiet man, very sincere individual, uh, who worked hard at what he did. 
He was ordained a priest on May 25, 1963. After serving at various parishes in Oklahoma, he was sent to Oklahoma's Guatemala mission in 1968. When Stan arrived at the mission, he joined a team of five other priests, a former Navy nurse, three nuns, and two papal volunteers. Father Ramon Carlin was the pastor of the mission. Father Carlin saw a great potential in Stan, and he was the one who really tried to help him a great deal. And uh, of course, what he saw was really there, because Stanley Rother turned out to be the best of all the missionaries we ever had there, and also the one who was the most uh, persevering. Much as it is today, Stan found Guatemala to be a land of contrasts. Rare beauty and extreme poverty. He often referred to it as the land of eternal spring. Much of the village life is centered around Lake Atitlan. The lake is their source of water, used for fishing, drinking, cooking, and washing. The Zutuwil men and women have strictly separate roles. Women scrub the clothes by hand, rubbing them against the rocks. Men work the land, toiling long hours in the sun for two or three dollars a day. Shoes are not often seen on an Indian woman. This is part of the ancient culture the Zutu wheel have retained. They live in a life wrapped in hand-woven color. Their distinctive clothing can be recognized anywhere in Guatemala. Their Mayan heritage is one of the few things they can call their own. However, the shackles of tradition play a major role in preventing progress. <laughs> Religious practices vary from Orthodox Catholicism to a strange mixture of Christianity and paganism. Most all of them, however, claim to be Catholic, and religious life centers around the white-walled church of Santiago. They place a high value on community life. Stan found them to be a gentle people. When he went to Guatemala, uh, it seemed that he found the niche, he found his place. He found people that he was able to identify with, that he was able, felt that he was able to give something to, that he was able to help them, he was able to raise them up. And that was the work that he worked at. Stan preached a social as well as spiritual gospel. His farm skills proved to be more useful than his Latin. He cleared land for cultivation and set up an extensive irrigation system. He planned a land program near the village that would let Indians buy the land they tilled. But this part of his dream died when he did. He talked about his, where he pushed his rock off of, the, off of this ground just so he could make a nice farming spot for these people down there just to have food to eat and feed their family because those people didn't do any of this until he got there. And after he got there and showed them how, then they, then they got enthused about it. And that's, that's when it really took off. And then after his death, then it went to pot again. It, they just quit. Stan believed in education, practical skills, as well as learning to read and write. He wanted the children to have a chance their parents never had. He believed that promoting literacy would lighten the weight of burdened lives. I think that for all the things that he hoped for for his people, and that was t at one time he said he could give them so very little, 
but if he could just give them a faith to live by in the midst of their oppression, that would be the least that he could do. Give you a little bit of an idea of Father Stanley. Um, his goals were very simple, very simple. It was simply, how can I make life better for these people? And he could make life better. One, you saw his agricultural skills. He took a trailer actually one time with, with a stone remover so he could turn all that savage land into farm. And one of, his, one of the biggest source of pride was the farm he had created where people could, could raise their own crops and that made the people independent. Now that was the, the first thing that labeled him, quote, to be killed was that people were now independent. They were not dependent on the large hacienda owners. They could grow their own food. And he actually went to Oklahoma and he had studied the rain records and the soil records. He took the soil, he had the sun records and the rain records, and he took it to be analyzed. And so they told him what kind of seeds would grow best in that land in that condition. So he actually went back, and if you, if you traveled, you know how seeds are very internationally controlled. Well, he had seeds sewn into his underwear <laughs> and to his socks, and, and he said it was the longest trip he'd ever taken. You know? <laughs> But, but those were the seeds that then turned the farm into a farmland, uh, and they had a natural crop. And that was one of his, quote, crimes. Uh, they had given the people food to eat, very simple food, natural food. He also believed he saw in education. He thought that the people showed simple trades. Uh, and so he had a school, a technical school, an elementary school, teach the people to read and write. Most of the people were totally, totally uh, uneducated. They couldn't read or write, so they couldn't communicate. So he was teaching them how to read and write, he was teaching them how to, how to grow their own substance. And most of all, he was interested in the faith. He said, you know, if nothing else, if nothing else, give people a faith to be able to sustain what they're going through, to give them a sense of hope. Uh, you remind me very much of what the Holy Father has been saying. Don't rob the people of hope. You know? And Stanley was certainly a man of hope himself. Uh, he, and so he was with the people. And, and th those were the things that made him, quote, a radical. He wasn't a radical at all. I mean, you can see the things he did were super simple. Uh, but he, he was, on the, he was on, on the list to be killed, along with several other priests. Uh, in the literature, you say four priests, but by the time he was killed, there had been eight other Guatemalan priests that had been killed. Uh, and, and so he would write back, and he attributed the fact he was in trouble. He said his difficulty was that he talked too much when he came home. Uh, he had given a talk in the parish, and some of the people had written to the State Department from the parish uh, and said that this man was very un-American, that he was, he was not an example of good American. And so he wrote these letters, and they got to the Guatemalan government and so forth. It was a time of much turmoil. You remember those days in Guatemala, the late 60s, the 70s? I mean, they were horrible. I mean, entire villages were burned down. Uh, and his village was not in that relation. It wasn't hit that bad. But there were people constantly disappearing and then would reappear totally butchered, you know, martyred and killed. He didn't want to be martyred. He, in fact, he said uh, that they would not take him from his home alive. Uh, and sure enough, when, they, when the soldiers came in, uh, they came in mass. Nobody really knows who killed him. They, they, they condemned three Indian men, but they were sure that they weren't the ones. Uh, they think it was the government. They came in mass and they they forced a young boy to take him to his room. And when he came in, he said, look, just shoot me here. Just shoot me here. Don't take me out to be tortured. Uh, so he was killed in the rectory. He was killed in the rectory. And he was killed. And that was sort of the beginning, the beginning of his real life. Uh, because he entered into eternal life. And he gave his life for his people. He, he could have come back and he'd done great work here. But he couldn't stay with people he loved. That's the, where he found himself. And I think that's, that's the beauty of it. His belief, his belief was the gospel. That, that, that was his purpose. In fact, he wrote a letter, he wrote a letter to a cousin of his who was being ordained uh, in Oklahoma, Don Wolf. And he wrote a beautiful letter to him. And the letter he tells him, you know, don't forget you're being ordained to be a servant. Uh, don't fall into clericalism. Again, I'm reminding you of what our Holy Father is saying nowadays. Um, this, this has nothing to do with our Holy Father. But it reminds me of him. He said, you're, you're being ordained to serve, and it's a privilege to serve. It's a joy to serve. Uh, don't forget 
never forget that. Uh, and that was Stanley. He, he was a simple man of faith, of profound faith. Uh, and he, the letters he wrote, for example, about the number of First Communions he was preparing for, the number of confirmations, the number of marriages he'd come, uh, he'd be able to bless so he could have a better life. His whole life was a sacramental life, but included the rest of the community. Uh, and it was beautiful the way he integrated. He integrated. He wasn't good in theology. He wasn't good in languages back here. He wasn't good, but he had the love of God. He had the love of God, and he had that love that, that knew that he knew that, that that love meant real things in practical life today. It wasn't just a theoretical love, but it was one that was really reached out to the people. Um, his name was, by the way, uh, his name was, um, when he was baptized, the priest didn't want to name him Stanley because he wasn't a Christian name. That's what the priest said. So he added uh, Francis. Francis Stanley was his name. But he always grew up as Stanley, but in Guatemala, the, the Indian people fell in love with the name Francis because of St. Francis. So they named him Father Pa. That was the, the Mayan word for Francis. Uh, and that's the way he's remembered today. Uh, he said Father, Father, uh, Father Pa. Uh, and so he's with the people now. and It's just a beautiful testimony. I've seen a beautiful testimony of, of the life of a priest, of a life of a priest that is totally involved with the people, uh, totally involved with people, his own clothing. He was, his, his people would go visit him in Guatemala and he'd ask them to bring some, some patches with him so they could patch the clothing. Uh, he didn't want to dress up because he'd be more than the people. He wanted to be with people in, in every way, uh, in a simple way, in simplicity, and his heart is still there. And it, it's just a heart, but it's not just a physical heart. Uh, the, his spirit is still there. And it's a, it's a very alive place now because of him. Uh, it's the blood of martyrs that keeps the church in action. So that's Father Stanley. That's Father Stanley. He's a beautiful young man. I remember him very, very well. And I say we were born the same year, ordained the same date, and he lived a better life than I did because he gave his whole life to, to God. So that's, you know, have any questions or any points we can discuss. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just really beautiful. Uh, he wasn't publicized much because he didn't have a religious community to publicize him. <laughs> you know, he, he was a diocesan priest, so he didn't have a, a group, a family, to quote, an official family, to, to push for his cause. But I, I think in a, way, in a way, that's part of the beauty of it, uh, that he remained anonymous, and, and he's happy in that, and in, uh, being anonymous, uh, that he's happy that, that he did his job and he did it well. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the great tributes of Father Stanley. So that's Father Stanley Rother. Uh, if you have any questions or anything that I'd like to talk about, uh, I think I mentioned everything I wanted to say about him. Uh, it's a brief talk. We often get talks on saints here, but nobody that has ever um, lived with them or had a chance to, I mean, for the most part, been in the same uh, time frame. What about him did you sense that sent him different or special or on a life that ended up the way it was. I mean, was there something? I think in hindsight, in, hi in hindsight, uh, he was always a contemplative. He was always a contemplative because uh, looking back uh, at him, he was a good swimmer, he was a, he was a good runner, uh, and he loved the outdoors. He loved the outdoors, uh, but, but he was always in, in chapel especially. Uh, he, he was a very contemplative person. And like I, said, like I said before, he didn't talk much, uh, but, but he was a contemplative. And you could see that, that he had, he had the, uh, a sense of communion with the sacred, a sense of communion with the sacred that was very obvious in hindsight. Uh, when we were in seminary, you know, thinking of different things and all that. But I remember more just as one of the guys. Uh, he was, like I say, he was a good swimmer, he was a good runner, he was a good outdoor man because he loved the outdoors. Plants, flowers, trees, that was his world. Uh, and in fact, strawberries. One time he, 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 he planted a whole bunch of strawberries so he could have strawberry dessert in the seminary. But those were the incidentals. Uh, the main thing was his life of prayer. Uh, he, he was very, very much in, into the simple prayer. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't like the office. He didn't understand it. Uh, he didn't, <laughs> he, I mean, that was him, you know. He, he, was a, he was a simple soul, but he was communion with God. Uh, and, and, that's, and that transferred to, to 
to Guatemala because there it was sim his simply love for the people. That, that love just communicated to the people radically. Uh, they loved him. Uh, the, the, the day he was killed, uh, the day he was killed, the word got out immediately. And if you know the Mayans, you know that they're very quiet people in a way. Uh, they, they, they all came out and immediately the plaza was surrounded with people, uh, not saying a word. Not saying the word, just the vigil of just presence there to his body. But it, it was a, it's, it's a man of, really a man of God. Yeah. Yes. In the video, it sort of mentioned that he had this dream about taking this farm that he had created and, and making them more independent, but then it sort of fell apart. I was wondering what it, whatever happened to that. It fell totally apart. I understand it's been revived now. But that was his dream. He created a farm. There was no farm there. There was no farmland. Uh, and he created a farm by, by, by actually doing away with trees and rocks and all that and turned into a farmland. And that was his pride and joy, uh, that the people were now... But that what he had learned as a boy in Oklahoma, he transferred to Guatemala. Uh, and he transferred and he was developing beautifully. And again, in, in his letters, in his letters he, he quotes that the price of wheat had gone up a bit. So they're, they're, making, actually, they're making a little money now. Uh, not much, but a little bit. So, the, so he was very concerned about the, the prices. He was very concerned about the, the, the outcome. And, and the farm was his pride. Uh, uh, and the people, they, they maintained that pride. The, the, once they learn something, it's theirs. Uh, and he saw that as freedom. He saw that as real liberation, real freedom. That once you, you have learned something, you're out of the cage. Uh, you're out of the cage and you're able, and you're able to to transfer that wisdom to somebody else. And that's what happened. Uh, what is the status of his cause? Uh, it's, it's in Rome. It, 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 it passed the diocesan uh, canonical court, and now it's, it's in Rome in the Congregation for Saints. That's why he's a servant of God. Yes. Yes. Uh, you say his heart is still there. Is there a, a shrine? Oh, yes. People? Yeah. Do they have a new Oh, there's, a, there's a priest there now, yes, yes. No, it's very active now. And actually, there's not so much violence now. And the sad thing in Guatemala, the sad thing in Guatemala is, is the place where there's the greatest activity of proselytism. Uh, Guatemala is the first country that's less than 50% Catholic now. Uh, it, one, because so many people were killed. Two, because the evangelicals have made a real aggressive role in Guatemala. But that mission is still very active now. Yeah. It, it was dead for a while, uh, but it, it's been revived. Thanks so much. Do you have to, uh, to be a saint it's initially about having a miracle or something? Uh, I think two miracles, yeah. yeah. So was there? Uh, not that I know of. Maybe you can claim one. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, okay, that's correct, yeah. So, what is, what is, uh, that's, yeah. No, that's right, Martyr would be a says. So, I, I don't know what the status is. It's in Rome right now. And as far as I know, nobody's pushing it. But it's the same for many of us, you know. Could, could you explain what the government situation was down there at the time? And then, how long was the church dead? And it's apparently coming back now. And what they have actually going on. It, it was a very sad moment because there were guerrilla fighters and there's a government that was very, very anti the native people. Uh, they said the native people didn't want to join civilization. They didn't deserve to live. Uh, that, that was the official uh, policy of the state. Uh, and so actually their entire villages were burned down with the people in them. You know, it was a very sad period. It was the, it was the, the worst period. With them. Uh, and then, of course, there were guerrilla fighters. And then the guerrilla fighters, you weren't too sure what side they were in. Uh, they were in one side or the other. Uh, but it, it was a time when it really things were just incredibly bad in Guatemala. Now they're, they're stable. They're stable. And, but the results of that, uh, the, that uh, you know, the government opposition are still there. It, it was time, you know, in our own State Department, you know, it was a time later on of Nicaragua, the Contras, and so forth. There was a lot of confusion, a lot of, a lot of turmoil, but Guatemala was probably the worst. And, you know, they had the marital sisters were killed there, 
and they had many of their own native priests were also killed there, and many of the catechists were killed. See, when, when, when a priest gets killed from the U.S., uh, our State Department gets involved, and we become known. When the native people get killed, they just get killed, they're just less of them. But, but the numbers in Guatemala that were killed were, were unbelievable. This was probably the worst, I think. Although Nicaragua was very bad too, Nicaragua, uh, I was there with a film crew and the, the, the roads were bombed, the, you know, they had, you had to be careful when you were driving because the bombs were buried in and, and Salvador was horrible. And, uh, so it, it was the whole Central American situation was very unstable. And unfortunately it's, it's rising up again. It's been stable, but it's, it's beginning to rise up in Honduras and in Salvador. Is it still mostly Mayan people there? In Guatemala, yes. Are they there safe today? Uh, mm. Fairly. Fairly safe, but not completely. Mm. Not completely. Uh, the, what the, the, the nuns that were in, in Atitlan, uh, the, the nuns when the, the time Father Stanley was killed, they, they were native Guatemalans. Uh, they were native Mexicans of Mayan descent. Native Mexican and Guatemalans, and they were doing a terrific job with the people. Uh, and they were the ones that really kept the people from, from really having an uprising after Father Stanley was killed. Because they, they immediately started uh, bringing the people in, in, into singing, into singing a, a penitential type song and so forth, and they turned it into an occasional prayer, uh, which would have been a, a lot worse if they hadn't. So, so there, are, there are Native nuns, and they're having a big effect on the people. Yes. In the process of canonization, is there a certain element of uh, competition between one candidate and another? <laughs> For example, is uh, Archbishop Romero in competition with Father Stanley for canonization? I don't think it's a competition. I think the cause of Archbishop Romero, as I've heard, has been clear at the objections at the Congregation of the Faith, as I've heard. Uh, because there's some objections whether it's political or uh, or faith and all that. I don't know where Father Stanley's cause is right now. I don't think there, there's in competition. Uh, maybe the Cardinal could answer that they're not good. I don't think they're in competition, but simply one is not being pushed as much as the others. Uh, Romero's case seems to be, seems to be there already. Uh, Father Stanley is still waiting. Yes. Father, when you were growing up together, what did you do to encourage one another in the midst of all the cultural confusion? <laughs> Well, we kind of stuck together, <laughs> you know, kind of stuck. Yeah, there was a lot of cultural confusion at that time. But, but we kind of stuck together and, and, and tried, to in, uh, tried to inject into the seminary some of our customs, some of our language, some of our songs and so forth. But, it, you know, it wasn't bad will. It was just a lack of understanding. You know, because the priest in the seminary were marvelous priests. But, but with Stanley, was more the fact he could make the grade. You know, I mean, the, the books were in philosophy, they were Latin, and they just didn't make sense to them, you know. But, but with, with myself, it was more of a cultural thing. Uh, you know, the, 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 relig the, the religious practice of seminary were quite different from what we had at home, you know. They were totally different. And so that was, that was a, a, a challenge there, uh, to, to try to bring in what we felt was legitimate. Uh, devotions, prayers, music. In, into the general seminary life. But we succeeded. I'm here. <laughs> Are there uh, any kind of artifacts like the uh, collection of sermons or did, uh, were they ever recorded? Do we know how he, since he wasn't that learned though, he must have had a way of speaking and a message that he proclaimed. Is any of that preserved somehow? Yeah, I think they're making a collection of it, John. They have his letters. Uh, and his letters are very concrete. Uh, his letters are very, very concrete, and they're letters to his mother and father. They're letters to this lady that appeared in the video. She was one of the big benefactors. And they always deal with the basic facts. How do we get the sacraments to the people? Uh, that, that was his major concern. Uh, how do you get the sacraments? How do you make the sacraments signs of life for the people? How do you make them real celebration for the people? Uh, so they're not just a cultural thing, but, but they're real encounters with God. Most of what's preaching was very simple catechesis, uh, very simple catechesis, and, and that, that, that revolved around the sermons. Uh, his sermons, I think, are being collected now, but as far as I know, they're not published yet. Yeah. Only his letters have been published. 
and their, their collection of letters, and St Stanley was, um, he knew his letters were being censored, so he, he's very careful in what he writes. You have to read between the lines, uh, and what just even hints is kind of dangerous something, because at that time, you had to sneak letters out, because if you send the regular mail, you would be sure they'd be censored. Uh, so he was very careful in his writing that he would not implicate himself and make himself more and you know more against the government. Uh, but but the, his sermons, most of them were simply at lib, uh, but they're being put together. Somebody? Yes. Yes, into the Indian language. It's it's still going, the Tetzal. Yes, it's still still going. Uh, it was a project he had started to get the Bible into their language, and it's still an ongoing problem. Anything else? Well, I want to thank you. It's, it's uh, you know, Stanley was a simple man but he was a simple man of God. And that was his charm. That was his charm, that was the basis of his work. He wasn't extraordinary in any, in any big way, and yet that's what made him so extraordinary. Uh, that he simply lived, lived the gospel, he was simply a good diocesan priest in a foreign mission. And his work was with the people, with the sacraments, uh, with, with the Eucharist, who celebrated in a festive way, with the people, to be with them, to be available to the people, to become one with the people, uh, to take on the smell of the people, as our Holy Father has said, and he certainly did that, uh, to take on the smell of the people. I mean, he, he fell in love with those people. And he said himself several times, you know, when he came to Oklahoma, he just, he, he found nothing there. Uh, he said, no, his life was already over there, and he had really become in, incarnate with the people. They'd become part of him, and he'd become part of them. Uh, and he, he felt at home there. He learned the language. He was with the people, he loved them, he loved the kids, he always had kids around him. Uh, he always had kids around him, and that's what made him such a special priest. Uh, he was a diocesan priest of the people and for the people, and they became his and became theirs. He took on their smell, as, as the Pope has said. He took on the smell, the smell of the sheep, and he certainly did that. And because of that, I think that's his greatness, uh, that he was a, such a simple man, a very much like curate of arts. He, he was there for the people, and, and that's beautiful. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>